relentless sweep of communism has radically changed the map of Europe. For the Europe which we know today is considerably different from the one which existed a generation ago. Now it is a continent divided against itself. The Soviet Union, replacing the old czarist Russia, emerged with the end of World War I. The once proud Baltic nations of Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia gained their independence in 1918 and remained so until they were absorbed into the USSR in 1940. At the conclusion of World War II, eight more countries had fallen under the hammer and sickle, and an important part of historic Europe today is under communist domination. These are the communist-dominated countries of Europe which exist today, and which lie between the free nations of Europe and the Soviet Union. Together, they comprise an area extending a thousand miles from north to south and some 650 miles from east to west, with a combined population of around 120 million people. The mountainous character of much of the region, because it has made movement difficult, has tended to isolate the various groups from each other. But that circumstance has not shielded this part of the world from involvement in the history of the world at large. Indeed, a good deal of modern history started in this region. Nazi Germany's attack on Czechoslovakia foreshadowed the beginning of World War II. With Germany's invasion of Poland in 1939, that war officially began. The Soviet Union joined the Nazi attack and then entered into a cynical collaboration to partition Poland, the fate of this part of the world was sealed. Later, Soviet troops fought the German armies in these lands. of the war, Soviet domination was assured when the Russians stayed on in all the countries except Czechoslovakia. And in that country, which had no Russian troops, the communists staged a bloodless coup d'etat and won control in 1948. Communist governments were set up in each of the countries, and each became a satellite of the USSR. Yugoslavia, under its own dictator, Marshal Tito, broke this pattern in 1948 by proclaiming its right to pursue its own path toward socialism. For this show of independence, it was expelled from the common form, the political union of communist states, and Tito was branded as a revisionist, one of the worst crimes in the communist book. Today, Yugoslavia is not under the domination of the Soviet Union, but it remains an independent communist state. It is necessary to remember that these are all separate countries with separate histories and separate characters. But the fact that each is communist and the fact of their physical proximity to each other enable us for the purposes of this film to consider them as a unit. The people who populate this region are of many strains and of cultures and traditions which reach back into the haze of antiquity. Religion has always been a powerful social force among the peoples of these lands. The Eastern Orthodox Church largely prevails in Romania, Bulgaria, and Yugoslavia. The religious character of East Germany is Protestant. The Roman Catholic faith predominates in Poland, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia. Communism has shown its hostility toward religion in many ways, such as discouraging the holding of services and religious instruction. 
the free world has seen this hostility revealed in the persecution of Cardinal Menzenti in Hungary. The imprisonment for a time of Cardinal Wyszynski in Poland. And of Archbishop Stepanak in Yugoslavia. But through all these restrictive measures, the basic religious spirit of the people has endured and occasionally has resulted in some relaxation of the state's anti-religious campaign. The economy of these countries, generally speaking, has traditionally been basically agricultural. This historic reliance upon the land itself shows the influence of communism today chiefly in the effort toward land collectivization. A policy already fully achieved in the Soviet Union and now transposed to the peasants of East Central Europe. Collectivization works two ways. Peasants owning land are required to turn it over to the control of a collective administration subject to the dictates and policies of the government. Other farms, so-called state farms, are run directly by the government. Complete success in this endeavor has not been achieved throughout the satellites. Only 1% of the farms in Poland are collectivized, and some 12% are state farms, although much more land was collectivized before the government returned it to the peasants in 1956. In Bulgaria, however, 95% of the arable land has been collectivized. And East Germany claims 100% collectivization. So far, collectivization has not increased food production in Eastern Europe to any appreciable extent and is still widely opposed by the peasants themselves. If agriculture bears the communist stamp in this region, industry bears it more. The need to industrialize is a basic principle of communist ideology, and the communist countries of Eastern Europe have pressed for rapid industrialization with great emphasis on basic heavy industry as a fundamental part of their economic programs. Czechoslovakia and East Germany, whose associations in the past have always been with the Western world, show the most advanced state of industrialization. But even in the most primitive industrial states, such as Albania and Bulgaria, the results are dramatically clear. The communists point to the achievements of this region as part of their boast that they will overtake and eventually outproduce the West. The communists recognize education as a powerful social force and have exploited it to the full as an instrument of indoctrination. Their emphasis today is placed on technical, scientific, and practical training. The communists also make wide use of sports in their youth training programs, particularly sports with a strong military flavor. In all these ways, the influence of communism can be seen in the satellite countries. But it's in the political realm that the nature of a communist state is revealed most clearly. Like the USSR, each of the other Soviet bloc countries has a totalitarian structure of government with absolute power wielded by the Communist Party. Each uses rigged elections with only the candidates satisfactory to the party on the ballot. In each, the party has absolute administrative and police powers and uses those powers to control the civil actions of the populations. Yes, the presence of communism shadows every facet of life in these countries, as it has for more than a decade. How do the people themselves respond? 
We need not necessarily trust the parades which abound in these lands as evidence of popular loyalty to the regimes. For the most part, these demonstrations are whipped up by party leaders to promote discipline. Neither, of course, can we assume that the people in these nations are ready at any moment to revolt against their masters. But the uprisings in East Germany and in Hungary in 1956 demonstrated to the world with dramatic poignancy that the memory and the hope of freedom do not perish easily, and that when they are pushed too far, People living under any tyranny, communist no less than other oppressions against which men have struggled for centuries, will strike against it. Those uprisings demonstrated also, however, another clear and hard fact, that behind the authority of the state in the communist satellite countries stands the naked power of the Soviet Union ready to crush ruthlessly any show of independence which threatens its supremacy. In several of these countries, Russian troops are still stationed, but whether they are actually stationed in a satellite country or not, they are in every case close enough to intervene quickly in event of trouble. Yugoslavia, of course, which won its independence from Soviet domination more than a decade ago, is an exception so far as Soviet control is concerned. It is itself a dictatorship, as any communist country must be in order to exist, but its people are at least free of direct control by Moscow. Poland, too, has a measure of independence not enjoyed by the other satellite states. The Russians believe they can count on Poland's loyalty, primarily perhaps because Poland believes that it is dependent on Soviet support to keep German provinces, which it was awarded after World War II. As a result, in its limited freedom, domestic policies of the Polish government are in a number of respects at variance with those of the USSR and other dominated countries. Thus, there is less collective farming in Poland than in the other countries, more freedom of religion, and less rigid control of the civil behavior of the population. In foreign policy, however, there is no deviation at all between the position taken by the Soviet Union and that of any of the satellite countries. Here, unquestionably, Moscow calls the tune. Yugoslavia likes to consider itself aligned with neither the East nor the West, but neutral in the great struggle. It is no accident, however, that Yugoslavia sides with the Soviet Union more often than with the United States and its allies. For independent or not, the communist view of world affairs is set in the mold cast by Marx and Lenin, a point of view that does not often coincide with that taken by non-communist countries. The foreign policy of the Soviet Union, which is supported and embraced by its satellites, is, in a word, conquest. They envision the entire world Sovietized and united communist style. So far, deterred by the strength of the free world, their policy has been to seek this goal by means short of war, by subversion where possible, by infiltrating ideas and material where they can, by attempting to convince the great and growing mass of uncommitted nations that communism is a way of life superior to all others. The satellite countries fully support this program. In the United Nations, they vote undeviatingly, the Moscow line. Machinery from industrially strong satellite nations such as Czechoslovakia goes into the underdeveloped countries which the USSR wishes to infiltrate economically. The armed forces of the satellites are there to be counted in any assessment of the strength of the communist world. An estimated one million ground troops are presently under arms in these countries, excluding, of course, Yugoslavia. The satellite armies follow the Soviet model using its tactics and organization, although they are not trusted with all the latest equipment from the USSR. Comparatively large reserves also stand ready for mobilization in each country. 
Their air forces consist largely of Soviet jet fighter interceptors. Their navies are for the most part small. Only Poland has one of any substance. Probably more important to the Soviet Union than their standing military forces, however, are the strategic advantages for military operations which they offer. Their ports make virtually a communist-controlled lake of the Baltic Sea and give the Soviet Union vital access to the Mediterranean. They provide advance bases for potential missile launching sites, sites which would bring into the range of Soviet IRBMs parts of Europe and North Africa that could not be reached from bases in the USSR. For all these reasons, the Soviet Union considers the satellite countries to be vital to its own position in the world, and there's little doubt that it is determined to hold them in its orbit by any means. What is our own nation's attitude toward the countries of communist Europe? Inasmuch as Yugoslavia must be considered separately from the others, we can look at that nation first. Our relations with Yugoslavia take into account the fact that it is independent and neutral. Today, we provide Yugoslavia with economic aid. Why? The basic purpose of this assistance is to strengthen Yugoslavia in maintaining its independence. This aid has made it easier for the Yugoslav government to resist pressure by the Soviet Union to bring Yugoslavia back into the Soviet bloc. Our relations with Yugoslavia do not signify endorsement of its political system. Rather, the political system is seen as an internal matter in which we should not intervene. While Yugoslavia remains a communist state, its independence has brought with it the disappearance of many of the harsher aspects of communist rule as well as greater contact and freer exchange between Yugoslavia and countries outside the Soviet orbit. But what about our attitude toward the other communist countries of Europe, those that are actually satellites of the Soviet Union? In the complicated world we live in, the answer to this question is not simple, nor is it easy to define. But generally, it can be stated this way. Our government and our people have a deep concern for the welfare of the people of the countries under Soviet domination. And we share their aspirations that they will someday regain their independence. For the time being, and under the present circumstances, we can only seek to keep them aware of our interest and concern and to maintain contact with them in every way that is open to us.